And this is a number one, I mean, if you're a business owner or a solo entrepreneur, or entrepreneur, even if you're just an executive or a manager in an organization, you got to listen to the customers. Yeah. And I spent 12 years getting trained by my organization and going to all these conferences and getting all this training on how to do your job. And I realized as the world changes and modern technology takes over and, and especially the world of finance changes, it's really what the people need and want. And we actually listen to what they were saying and they were asking us to provide some services that we just weren't allowed to in that model and so we said well the only way we can provide these is if we do it ourselves hello i'm aaron marcus founder and ceo of conquer your business and i want to welcome you to ready yet if all you needed was a step-by-step -step plan of what to do you could buy a book on how to succeed and you would be all set but here's the rub You'll never do what it takes until you become the person it takes to do it. The Ready Yet podcast is dedicated to those who are ready to become the person who succeeds, ready to become the person who steps into more, and ready to become the best version of themselves. In the I'm Ready interview series, join me for inspiring conversations with people who figured out who they needed to be in order to achieve their dreams and we're brave enough to be that person. Hello, hello, and welcome to this episode of the Ready Yet podcast, where I get to have amazing conversations with amazing people and share their stories with you about who they had to be in order to get to where they are and what it is that they're doing now. And I'm excited about today's guest because when we had our prep call, we had all these crazy things that were in common, which you wouldn't have even thought of. And you know, I love a really interesting story. So I'm very excited that Bob Despe I messed it up anyway. De Pasquale is here with me today. And I seriously, I can't wait to share a story with you. So Bob, why don't you give everybody a little more formal introduction to who you are and what it is that you do? Absolutely. Aaron, thank you for having me on the show. Pleasure to be here, uh, Ready Yet Podcast. Excited to share a little bit about my journey, but you know, really more just share about the journey as uh, we are as entrepreneurs, business owners, and people who really care about the world. Uh, I, I, I call myself a purpose-driven impact maker. I'm very intentional about the work that I do these days of my life because uh, some of the things I've been through have taught me that you're really not guaranteed tomorrow, and uh, you really don't know the forces in your life that are there to help you. And figure and figure out what it is that you want to do, how to make that positive impact. And without them in my life, I wouldn't be where I am today. So I try to be that person, whether someone on the other end knows it or not. Uh, you may not change the world, but you might change the world for one person. Absolutely. So I love that because, as you know, because we had this conversation, a lot of my my folks know I volunteer every week at a wildlife rescue, and that philanthropic part of my world. Um, is very important to me. And what I noticed is even when I don't talk about it, even when someone doesn't know about it, the people who I find in the universe have that same feeling, that whole like attracts like. And you I, just find these people. Yeah, I, I love that because, uh, you know, they talk about these days and on the social communities and different platforms out there about finding your tribe or your community and really, it just you just live it out and you exude that energy, right? And the people, you, you find your niche, if you will, just by being who you want to be. And sharing who you are, yep. as opposed to who you think you're supposed to be, as opposed to think it being who you think others expect you to be. And I know you have a little bit in that of that in your background. Because anybody who used to have a job and then go into entrepreneurship has along the way met, been face to face with their mother who thought they were crazy, right? <laughs> like that is how that works. That's the conversation, explaining to your mother while you're quitting a six-figure job to strike out on your own, right? That's, that's the big one. Do, do you know my mother? <laughs> I mean, like this definitely had this conversation. So what was that like for you? Like I ask people all the time, entrepreneurship, especially in the beginning is like falling off a cliff. You might've jumped or you might've been pushed, but you find yourself plummeting off the cliff. So how did you start that journey? Well, my mother actually worked for me before I made this transition. So that's, that's why awesome. I was joking a minute ago about 
about if you know my mom, because I literally had to sit down and have this conversation with her. Basically, mom, I love you if you watch this back, but we kind of had to force her to retire. So that <laughs> you had, a, you had to fire your mother, right? Is that what yeah. you're telling me? Yeah. We didn't want to fire her. But to be honest with you, all the other loving people in her life knew that she needed to retire too. She didn't need to keep working. Right. Uh, and so I told her, I was like, mom, uh, you know, we plan on making the transition at some point. We didn't know all the finer details right there, but I was like, it's probably a good time. We set out a timeline. And she's like, well, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, here's what we're thinking about, you know, and it was one of those things where it goes from mom being the supportive mother in, in any situation, almost so much so that you don't even want to ask her for feedback because she'll never tell you anything negative. Right. Uh, it went from that to completely like you're nuts and you're crazy what are you thinking you have you have a great where you're at right now you know and I want to keep working here and you should keep working here and we should keep building this thing and so it was tough it was tough that conversation um, and it's interesting because my business partner and I and the other people on our team for many many years me for about 12 years at the same company worked with a lot of business owners and I always make this joke I I worked with business owners and provided advice for them for so long that I kind of wanted to be one <laughs> it's so. so true. It's so true. It's, I see that a lot, you, you know, and the one thing we failed to say is that you're in the financial services world mm -hmm. and I have a background in financial services. And we used to see that a lot, even internally, like we weren't doing what you were doing. We were more on the corporate, like the help desk side, but so many people were providing advice to the advisors for so long that they wanted to get out there and provide it directly to the people. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in particular, you're in an industry though, where hanging out your own shingle is no small, this is no small thing. It's not just entrepreneurial, it's entrepreneurial with compliance from hell, <laughs> with legalities and processes and appointments and contracts like I could make up a new event a new course and launch it tomorrow you've got muckety muck to get through before you're allowed to even talk to somebody so what was I think that's an even a different layer of jumping off a cliff was it what you expected yeah well it's interesting how you word that in jumping off a cliff. So I actually have a story about literally jumping Falling off, off a cliff. cliff. Oh gosh. That that relates to this. So so in my previous employer, you know, we were very blessed and and I, I love working for them, love the people. We didn't actually want to leave for uh, friction mm -hmm. type of reasons. Um, and I can get yep. more into some of the details of why we decided to open our our own firm. We wanted to provide some deeper service for the people that we were working with, um, but. One of the places we were at, we were at a conference once and in Greece, actually. So I'm in Greece. Awesome. I mean, it's a beautiful place to go visit. Uh, and we were on so that, you know, you have these excursions that you can go on. Well, we just kind of us and a couple other couples, my wife and I, we said, well, let's just go wing it. We'll kind of just take this walk that we. So it's like this few mile walk from one end of the island to the other. And somewhere along the lines, we stopped. And I don't I, I don't know if they were locals or what, but people we're sw swimming around this beautiful rock formation in the water and we're looking we're like so let's get some water we're kind of hot so let's let's jump in the water and we swim around the side and there's this cliff and as soon as I got around the corner I saw someone go flying off the cliff oh and I panicked for a second because <laughs> I thought I, I thought someone was either fell or maybe was god forbid committing suicide I don't know like I was like well that's crazy and I hate heights Aaron, oh, there, I mean, well, I, yeah. So for you, there's no reasonable story around why this was happening. <laughs> yes. Why would this happen? Why would anyone do that on purpose? So I'm looking at it and I realized that there a couple more people jump off and I'm like, okay, phew. Uh, you know, everything's You're either lemmings well. or a... they're nuts. Like, why would you even <laughs> do that? So then uh, so one of the guys we were with is like, hey, I'm going to go climb up there. And I'm like, well, I'm not even going to climb up there because I, like I said, I, I can't climb a five foot ladder. I'd be terrified. Well, he goes up there and you can't really see what it takes to climb up there. And all of a sudden he's at the edge of the cliff and he like within a minute, he just jumped off. So I was thinking he was just going to climb up there and look and he jumps and 
um, then he comes swimming back over to us. He's like, oh man, this is awesome. You got to do it. And other people did it. And, and sure enough, I felt the peer pressure. Oh, wow. I actually climbed up there and I knew that I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to do it if I didn't just run. If I like went to look at the edge, I would have chickened right. out. Right. If you run. stop moving, that's it. It's over. That's exact words. And this is highly relative to my professional story because it's the same concept. I ended up getting to the top of climbing to the top of the cliff where it was. And I, like I said, didn't walk over. I basically, I looked, my wife was with me and I said, Hey, I'm just going to do it. And I knew I wasn't going to die because other people were doing it. So I like, I felt like I was, I was going to be terrified, but I'd still be alive. So that was a bonus. And I just took off running and I jumped right off the cliff and it was scary. And I hate that feeling of your stomach and your throat, but I did it. And I actually thought of this moment when my business partner and I decided to leave our company and start our own. And that's exactly what it was like. It feels the it same, was, right? Oh yeah. It was drinking from a fire hose. It was jumping off a cliff. It was whatever metaphor you want to talk about. And I never would have done it if we wouldn't have just taken the leap there. It was somewhat radical. There was probably, there weren't very many reasonable reasons or rational reasons that we would have done it. And, but we had some really strong thoughts about some very, very specific things and we wanted to chase that. And that was more important than all the other stuff. Right. And I, you know, I still get nervous when I wake up in the morning because we're, we're about 14 months into the business and we got a long way to go, but it's been a great ride. That's awesome. I love that story because so I've jumped off a cliff in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. I will tell you as a female climbing a cliff in a bikini being <laughs> led by essentially a 13 year old who doesn't speak English was a lot scarier than jumping off the cliff. But I've also <laughs> jumped off, I've jumped out of an airplane. Oh, and wow. going back to your story about just going for it in the class we took about how this works, cause we jumped tandem from like 13,500 feet. It was like way the hell up there. Um, they teach you what, what the instructor told us is when you get to the door and it's your turn, no matter what you do, don't touch the crossbar, the support bar that's above the door. And we're all like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, why? And she's like, we'll never get you off of it. Like if you grab onto the safety rail because you hesitate to jump, that's it. You're not going to jump. Mm. And I think there's so much truth to doing the thing before you've had enough time to think about the thing. And yeah. the beauty though is how long was it before something else scared you? Like I jumped out of an airplane and I don't think I was scared again for three years because there's just nothing scarier than that. <laughs> that was That's it. That's really, really good point. Yeah. That was it. So what were some of those impetus? What were some of the things that those driving forces that made you realize the normal path is not my path? Well, there were three uh, technical reasons, I guess you could say. I don't know if this is the path you're, you're looking for, but there were the three technical reasons of why we left and decided to go on our own path is the first, well, one's not really that technical. We just had the entrepreneurial itch. Like mm -hmm. I said, we were working with business owners and said, you know, what? we're providing advice on all of this stuff specifically related to their finances, but it's way more than that. It's also emotions. You're like a therapist, you're, you're a consultant and a business coach. And so it's like, well, why don't we do this ourselves? Number two was technology. Like you talked about compliance and ability to do the things that we wanted to do. I, mean, I have a broadcasting degree. I really wanted to do more media stuff like this, write a book. So that was another reason we just had a little bit more flexibility. And then finally, people were asking us, and this is a number one, I mean, if you're a business owner, a solo entrepreneur, entrepreneur, even if you're just an executive or a manager in an organization, you got to listen to the customers. Yeah. And I spent 12 years getting trained by my organization and going to all these conferences and getting all this training on how to do your job. And I realized as the world changes and modern technology takes over and, and especially the world of finance changes, it's really what the people need and want. And we actually listen to what they were saying and they were asking us to provide some services that we just weren't allowed to in that model and so we said well the only way we can provide these is if we do it ourselves and well so and that's such we a fan yeah and it's such a fantastic entrepreneurial lesson you know my focus the tactical side of my focus is very heavy in marketing and i watch so many entrepreneurs make the mistake of 
deciding what it is that they want to create in a bubble and then hope that somebody will buy it. And yeah, people have good instincts, but what you did makes so much more sense. Talk to the people you're serving. Now, here's the difference, you know, the Henry Ford quote, if I would have asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. You know, you've got to have some innovative ideas. Mm -hmm. You're not just handing them only what they want, but taking them that step further, you know, listening to what they say they want and then guiding them further Mm -hmm. into that. So what is your biggest surprise about becoming an entrepreneur? Running a business is easier yet more complex than I thought it would be. And what I mean by that is there's a lot more things that I didn't even think of that I have to do that aren't necessarily that challenging, but it's very, very time consuming and all the different bells and whistles that you have to handle to make sure that you have a compliant business, that you're you know, making all the authorities satisfied, that you're checking all the other little boxes of stuff that's not hard, but stuff that has to get done. Otherwise, you can't get to the hard stuff or do the, things, in my right. opinion, the fun stuff. Sometimes my, the challenges are the most fun, but you can't my, work on them 24-7. My first meltdown as an entrepreneur, you'll totally understand this. My first absolute meltdown as an entrepreneur was when the printer wouldn't print and I realized I had nobody to call. Like (laughs) there was no IT department to fix that. And I had no idea where to even begin. So all the things not related to doing what your business does for a living that you need to have in place in order to do what your business does for a living. Yes, because that's not your expertise. I, I should turn my camera around and show you the fancy printer that I have that I have no idea how to use since I left the office and didn't have IT support anymore. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the Ready Yet podcast. I know I really enjoy having conversations about who you need to be in order to reach new heights. As founder and CEO of Conquer Your Business, I work with my clients at the intersection where what they need to do to succeed meets who they need to be to do it. If you would like to have a conversation about your business, please reach out to me at erin at conqueryourbusiness.com. So why don't you share a little bit? I'd love to hear more of your story about how you chose to serve the community that you serve. Because interestingly enough that we were chatting about that before we hit record today, because during my monthly lunch and learn in my Facebook group where people just ask me questions, that was one of the things that came up. It's how do you choose your niche? How do you know? How do you know when it's changing? How do you decide that? And then you and I had a very interesting little two minute uh, exchange about that. So I happen to know that your niche is in philanthropic families and please, you know, fill that in more. How did that, as an entrepreneur, how did you come up with that? I've had the interest, desire, motivation, calling, whatever you would like to call it, since uh, I was about 20, early 20s to work with, surround myself with, be generous, uh, generous people, right? That's, that's really, really important to me. I did not realize, though, that it could be applied to entrepreneurship and to my business until more recently. And that's part of the reason why, why we made that transition. I mentioned how our clients were talking to me, my business partner, Stacy, uh, they would mention to us about transitioning this legacy of generosity from their generation to the next and making sure that their children are responsible with what they may inherit, whether it's a lot of wealth or a business or just a mindset. It's not necessarily about the money. And that's when we realized we could apply that to entrepreneurship. I didn't realize it. it, This may not be the right word, but there's a market for generosity. And what you're talking about, the way that I relate that to niche and the way that I teach that is what you're talking about is a psychographic instead of a demographic. Mm-hmm. Yep. A, right? You're identifying your target market by the way people think and the way they behave as opposed to whether or not they're married, how old they are and where they live. Exactly. It's an absolute psychographic. 
and I didn't realize there was such a need. And I, I figured out there was a need because of the work that we were doing and finding out that these type of people are severely, severely underserved. Um, the, it's, there's two types really, or not, that's, maybe that's generalizing a little bit too much, but there were two main scenarios uh, with obviously nuance involved in each situation. But the two main scenarios were, one, we had an ultra successful business, in family business, where they spent so much time working on this business, usually for good reason. It wasn't greed or anything. They were just super passionate about providing this service or selling this product or whatever it was. And that's what the family did really well. And just about all the family members worked really hard at it. And then they wanted to be super generous and philanthropic, but they didn't have the time or the desire to go through all of the steps that you have to do to do it right. And it's very, very complicated. And so that was one scenario. Or you had these people that would come to us and we would help them manage all, you know, all these little minute pieces of their financial lives, whether it was their taxes or their estate planning or, or helping with some business valuation or working on their risk management, all these little things. And they would, and they realized, they would say to us, well, we, we feel really, really comfortable now that we've worked with you. We, were, we came to you because we were so nervous and worried about our own personal financial situation. And, and you know, it, it's not overnight, but over time, you know, usually a couple of years, few years working with you, we suddenly have this amazing feel of comfort that now that we're so comfortable, what do we do? What do we right, do? They're with confident, all that comfort right? You, basically, what they're telling you is the plan worked. So, right? The yes, plan you and, put in place for them worked. Yeah. So, what do we do with it now? So, those are the two scenarios. And just in that experience, it helped me realize yeah, these people are really like, I don't want to say desperate, but they were really like crying out, like we really need more help with this. And I realized that the help with that is way more unique and to be honest with you, valuable than the other help, because there's plenty of people out there that can help you get your budget in order, but there aren't a lot of people uh, that are going to partner with you in your mission and your cause or whatever that is that you care about. And I love And I've had this in my world too. I mean, even in your perfect example of this, my people, most of my people know I volunteer on Fridays at a wildlife rescue. They know that it's front and center of my life. I make jokes all the time because we work so hard creating content and information to share and people respond to it. And then I post a picture of a possum that scared the bejesus out of me and everyone's all over. Yay. You know, sorry, because that's what they really want. But what has happened since I've made that so front and center in my life, even if it's not part of what I talk about is the people who feel that way are just, they just show up in my world. And it's that authenticity in your marketing, your, your personal story and your personal drive and your personal priorities that you're then able to utilize in service to other people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And by the way, I commend you for being so consistent with your, with the charitable work that you do. You know, I think, I think a lot of times those things can take a back seat because we get busy, caught up or business owners or entrepreneurs. You clearly prioritized it, which is, is really cool. Well, to I see. find that when you commit and the way that I did it is you put some pressure on yourself. I created a situation where if, um, if I'm not there, like other people suffer because it's, baby season here in the Midwest. And we're now getting inundated with baby squirrels and possums. And if I don't show up for my commitment, right, other people have to have to do that. But um, it's my version of self-care. It's not glamorous, but it's my version of a spa day. So hey, that's, self-serving that's, to some you. that's cool. <laughs> that is cool. Yeah, it wasn't so cool a couple of weeks ago when I got full on attacked by a goose, but hey, you know, I'm, I'm averaging a good wound per year. So it was time. It was time. <laughs> You're sacrificing to take over the team. <laughs> exactly. So, so cool. the other piece that I know you're passionate about, and this is what you wrote your book about, which I just find absolutely intriguing. So at my age, and I'll compare this story to, to the book that you've put together, I had a really hard time with social media. I had a really hard time with social media as a regular part of my life. I didn't grow up with it. I'm 52 years old, so I didn't grow up with it. Now, add to that the fact that I grew up in Chicago public schools in the 70s and 80s. I 
am often will say I was a professional juvenile delinquent. I <laughs> call it a professional because I made money at it. Right. I, I spent the first, my mother will attest to the fact that I spent the first 20 years of my life making sure nobody knew what I was doing. Right. <laughs> so this idea that you would I don't know, share literally everything you were doing was very foreign to me and outright threatening. Mm -hmm. So your book, and I wrote this down so I'd get it right, Personal Finance in a Public World. Where did that fit into your experiences and what you knew you had to share? Well, the first thing I'll start with is anyone's out there considering writing a book, I absolutely applied the jump off a cliff method to writing this book. Yes. Uh, I had I've about read two a book, hours. so I've got to be able to know how to write one. I've read a few books, right? Let's just do it. <laughs> yeah. And I was so freed when I had the opportunity, when I, we knew that we were leaving our company and I, and I would have the opportunity to write the book and send out an email to some publishers. They asked me, one of them wrote back, I'm so surprised they were actually interested in the topic. And, they, <laughs> and he's like, so uh, how far along are you in your, in your manuscript? And I wrote back, I was like, I don't even know what a manuscript is. And he hooked me up with this writing cohort. And I had a meeting the following Monday, a Zoom meeting, kind of like this. And he told me all about this program. I was so pumped up. He goes, here's the deal. It starts in two hours. And it's our next cohort is starting. And I'm like, what? If I would have had two days, two weeks, two months to think about it, Aaron, I would have said, no, I dove right in. Yep. And two it's hours so later. True. I, it's so, take the inspired ready. action. I, that's what I, how I call it. Take the inspired action. Cap, cap, yeah, capitalize on it right away. And so you asked, you know, how that fits into what I was doing. So I wrote the book specifically for people that we may not be able to serve anymore in our new business. In our previous role at our max size, we, we were serving about 1,700 families, my team. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of and people. I felt we were, we were a mile wide and an inch deep. I wanted to be a mile deep and an inch wide with people, which is great. But that also means we need to severely cut down the amount of relationships we have because we just feel that we can't provide all the services that we would like to. And then so I knew I would be leaving some people hanging and potentially other people in the world that maybe needed to hear this message. And the message is specifically about uh, the stresses of technology and personal finance. And, the, and it, the main premise of the book when I started to write it was Technology can be used for a positive force in your life. It doesn't have to be something that you spend too much time on or that you spend a lot of money on or the social media ad space and retargeting it doesn't have to be this thing that you're that has a grip on your budget. And so I, I set out to write a book about that. Um, I have the expertise in the financial space by Malcolm Gladwell's definition of 10,000 hours. But what I didn't have was the expertise in the social media technology and the psychological aspect of it all. So I did a lot, a lot of research to be able to tie it all together. And I found out, believe it or not, by the time I ended up finishing writing the book, all the subject matter is the same, the same concept with technology, social media, and personal finance. The only difference is, it is, is that I realized the ultimate determination of if you, if you have that comfortable feeling about your finances is about your relationships with your money and also with the people around you. You can do all the, you can make all the money in the world, but if you don't have a healthy relationship with money itself and the people around you, you're never going to, you're never going to find that joy. The way that and I hear so that, hard. the way that I hear that um, phrased that I absolutely agree with is money does not solve money problems mm -hmm. because right. Money isn't the problem. Money doesn't solve money problems because if you interpret everything is scarcity or everyone is trying to get you or whatever else the other issues are with money, how much money you have doesn't solve that problem. That's why, you know, the whole thing about how lottery winners lose all their money because yep. the money didn't solve the problems. I have a stat about that in the book. Yeah. It's intriguing. So is, I have a weird question. Is the book that you set out to write the book that you ended up writing? Cause mine first one wasn't. <laughs> no, it like, kind of like I said, I mean, the subject matter is all the same. It, it, there, it's very, it, there's a lot of teaching in it, but the, the stories from my life and the, and the amount, I mean, I interviewed 40 something people for the book. So 
it, it's it's way more story driven. And my publisher and, and editor really helped me flesh this out. They said you, you got to have some relatable stories in there so that people will understand uh, what the, the points that you're making. Because some of the stuff I'm t- I talk about is very very technical, like cryptocurrency and insurance and retirement and taxes. Uh, but the stories were added by that. And then by the time I got to the end, like I said, it ended up being a book that not taught you the technical stuff, but also shared about the the need to have a good relationship uh, with your money more than the need to make sure that you pay off your debt in the exact fashion so that you can save every penny. Although I tell you how to do that, but it's more important that you're comfortable uh, with what you have. Love it. Love it. And I love the approach. So many of the money mindset books that are out there are really more about the manifesting money. And, you know, I love the idea of combining the technology that we're just, it's not going away. Right. I mean, we're just more and more and more immersed in it. So if I have a, I ended up with a new bank account for my business and somebody wanted a check and I (laughs) didn't occur to me to buy any checks when I open the account. It's yeah. been so long since I've written a check that I didn't, you know, that's just the way it works now. Yep, exactly. Awesome. The, the, the way our money system works is so digital now. I and mean, then you add on top of that decentralized finance and blockchain and those sort of things that it can be, it can move really, really, really fast. And, and I it's actually almost had dangerous. Someone, yeah. It's, I had someone ask me about a check the other real. day too. I think that's one of the things that if you're not used to it, for those of us who learned about money in a different way as a physical thing, um, it you can get yourself messed up because you don't correlate the the physical reality of money that you learned as a child mm-hmm. to what current money is. I was talking with um, someone on my team the other day. We were laughing because she got a check where she got paid by some kind of strange check and she printed it out on her own printer and then took a photo of it. And that's how she deposited a check. So if you think back of what we used to have to do where even our checks had magnetic strips in it and you needed two forms of ID to even deposit it. And now she printed a check from an email and used her phone to take a picture of it and deposit it. And it all went through just fine. Yep, it's a different world. And I, I actually was part of a fraud attempt once, someone sending me a fake check and depositing it and realizing it was fake. It was, I, it's a long story, but you got to be really careful out there too. You got to be yes. very, very careful. Awesome. So if people want to continue this conversation with you, and I highly, highly, highly recommend, you know, check out the book, Personal Finance in a Public World. And how is the best way for someone who's interested, you know, talk again a little bit about exactly who it is that you serve in your business and um, how, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Sure. So personally, I have a website, bobdeepasquale.com. All my social links are on there. My DMs are always open. Love to hear from people, especially on Twitter and Instagram. Those are probably my two most active profiles. You can find a link to the, the Amazon page for the book. Um, it's also, I'm, I'm actually recording the audio book right as we, uh, uh, right during this time right now. So the audio book will be coming out soon, but right now you can get the soft cover uh, and the ebook and then the, the hard cover is coming out later this year. So you can check all that out on the website. I uh, would appreciate the support, feedback, questions, by all means, uh, let me know. And then you talked about the people that I serve in my business. My business's name is Initiate Impact. And it's all about making a positive impact in the world and helping people make wise decisions with their finances so they can be as generous as possible. So if you're someone that values generosity and thinks it's important that we support our fellow human uh, and you have questions about financial matters, we're the people uh, that you should look up and we can have a conversation. I love, I love, love, love meeting new people. So especially people who are generous. So hit us up at initiateimpact.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories, your experiences, your time with me. This has been awesome. Um, I know I can only imagine. I can't wait to get the book and see for myself. I'm a little scared of the technology, mostly because I don't have the attention span for it. But (laughs) I love other people using it on my behalf is exactly what I want. There you go. Love it. Love it. Awesome. Thank you so much. 
Aaron, uh, it's been awesome. Um, you, I love your podcast. I love the I love the urgency and intention around what you do. So keep it up. Get out there, people. Make wise decisions and be generous. Thank you so much for joining me on the Ready Yet podcast. I get so motivated by the amazing accomplishments of the remarkable people I meet, and I'm excited to be able to share some of their stories with you. You can find more episodes of Ready Yet at your favorite source for podcasts or at conqueryourbusiness.com. And if you've already decided that you are ready to become the person you need to be to achieve your big goals, feel free to reach out to find out how I can support you in your efforts. Or check out the Work With Aaron page on the Conquer Your Business website. I also invite you to share this podcast with anyone you know who loves to learn and be inspired. And if you're so inclined, I'd be absolutely grateful for any reviews you'd like to share as well. Thanks again for joining me. This has been Aaron Marcus, hopefully inspiring and helping you to go conquer your big dreams.